Well, so um, good morning, Oakland educators. My name is Emily Kremitis, and I am your local manager of educational partnerships. It's a lofty title that means that I am here to support you in your implementation of programs from Center for the Collaborative Classroom. And specifically today, we're here to talk about SIPs and uh, supports that I can offer to you in, um, in implementing SIPs uh, as you engage in distance learning. And so there are a couple of resources that I wanted to share with you. Um, number one, I wanna make sure that you have access to your digital resources. I know not everyone has been able to, uh, to get back into their classrooms. And so I want to uh, share some things with you and make sure that you have access to those. Uh, secondly, uh, Center for the Collaborative Classroom has created some guidance around remote learning. And I wanted to make sure that you knew where that was. Um, also, we have a more and more robust everyday uh, Facebook community where, uh, where teachers like your, yourselves are sharing best practices that they, um, they've crafted. And I think that it's a really rich environment. So I want you to know about that. Um, and throughout, I want to make sure that you, um, you're asking the, the questions that you want to ask. So I would invite you to start, um, if you're unfamiliar with the Zoom environment, down at the bottom of your screen, there's a black bar in which there is a uh, talking bubble that reads chat. And so I'd invite you all to go ahead and click on that. And if you could follow uh, Brenda's lead and go ahead and, um, and tell me where you're coming from and who you work with, I'd really appreciate that. So uh, Brenda's at um, Martin, Luther King High, uh, Martin Luther King School, and she's working with SDC, third through fifth grade. Welcome, Brenda. Okay. Emma teaches second grade. Olivia is in kinder at Grass Valley. Welcome. Think College, second grade for Leah. Thank you. Right. Uh, Harris works in SDC at Brookfield. Sonia's in uh, K, uh, K1 at Bella Vista. Uh, Jacqueline, uh, one, two at Hoover. Ah, some Madison Park friends, uh, Mark. Uh, 612 reading intervention. Mark, just yesterday I was talking to uh, Colette about getting some more SIPs coming your way. Um, Stephanie is in second grade at RISE. Um, Diana is a literacy coach at EOP and Encompass, and Gilberto is a literacy coach at Greenleaf. Wonderful. So um, thank you so much. Um, oh, and we still have more folks coming. Laura works with newcomers. Um, let's see here. We have Michelle joining us who's doing middle school support and, uh, and Laura's from Skyline. All right. Um, so my experience, I was uh, primarily an elementary school teacher, though I also taught middle school. And I came to Collaborative Classroom most recently having been an elementary school principal in Petaluma uh, at a K-6 where I knew of Collaborative Classroom because we had both Caring School Community and also SIPs being used by my reading specialist and my RSP teacher. Um, so I'm, I'm so happy to, uh, to be here with you today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and, um, and make sure that you um, will start off with making sure that you have access to your instructional um, materials. Alrighty. So uh, first off, educators, I, I wanted to make sure that you knew of this website. So the website is cccleaninghub.org. And this is where you can find digital versions of your print materials for all curricula um, published by Center for the Collaborative Classroom. So again, it's cccleaninghub.org. Okay, and Irene is writing, um, the Zoom link on the central main page doesn't work. Um, Aaron, if that's something that you'll need to address. That's, uh, I just checked on that and just made sure that that's updated. Okay, all right. Um, so if you have not yet created an account at the Learning Hub, you'll want to do so. And the way that you do that is, um, 
don't fill this in, but rather click create an account. When you do, it's going to prompt you for an email address and a password of your choosing. I would have you use your OUSD um, email address. That helps us with troubleshooting and to know with whom you're affiliated. Um, after you do that and you click to submit, you receive a message prompting you that in your, uh, in your email, you have waiting for you a link that you need to follow. Um, if you don't have it, you'll want to check your spam filters, uh, but it comes from um, no response at Collaborative Classroom. Upon doing so, and mine looks a little bit different because I already have an account, but I'll, um, I'll show you how to how to access. Upon doing so, it's going to take you through a three-step process to establish your profile. And so when you click that link in your email address or in your email account, it's, uh, it's going to take you back into the website. You will log in and uh, it'll take you through three steps. The first is to confirm that you are in fact still you. Uh, the second is your affiliation. Your screen will look different. I'm, I'm an internal employee. Um, for yours, you will need the zip code of your school. And when you put it in, the screen will refresh and you will find your school in a drop down menu. Um, you can select your school and then also your title. And then the third step is to claim your, your licenses. So as I mentioned, there are several programs that we are supporting here in this digital format. Lots of people um, accidentally end up claiming licenses for being a reader, a program that they may or may not, may or may not have at their school just because it comes first in the list. You're going to want to click on SIPs and, um, and toggle to claim licenses for the um, the levels that you are teaching. Once you have toggled a level, you will have the ability to also select the SIPS assessment and card deck. I will point out to you, at, uh, if at any time in this process you experience hiccups, the most efficient thing to do is to click on the question mark that appears next to your name. Uh, when you do, a new tab will open. Um, prompting you that right now, since we are working on our site, there's, a, there's an email address here that we would direct you to follow. So it's support at collaborativeclassroom.org. Um, and when you send an email saying, um, I'm so-and-so from this school and I'm having difficulty claiming the following or what have you, my colleague Ron will support you in, um, in getting you what you need in order to, uh, to access your materials. After you have toggled uh, the appropriate materials for yourself, there is a save and exit down at the bottom. And anything that you've toggled uh, will then be a part of, um, of your list of options. So I have, um, and, and yes, Kaylin, we are recording this session. Um, I have additional materials. By the way, if there's anything here that you're interested in, you are welcome to establish a trial license uh, for which you would have access through July of this year. Uh, so kindergarten teachers, for example, you might want to take a look at the learning letter name support that we offer in Being a Reader as, um, as proficiency with letter names as a, is a precursor to, uh, to engaging in SIPs. I'm just scrolling through our programs. By the way, if you are implementing Caring School Community, those, uh, those materials are here for you as well, Blackline Masters and, and all of that. And so now I just wanna take you through uh, the resources that you'll find. Um, I'm going to use beginning, but these all have the same um, orientation and setup. So when I, when I go into beginning level SIPs, it's blue banded to remind me of which level I'm engaged with. And at the very top, I have my digital teacher's manual. When I click on that, it's going to open in a new tab and it will take me to the last place I visited within the manual. So I was looking at lesson 31, as you can see. Um, if I want to progress to lesson 32, 
that's easy enough for me to do. I just click the, uh, the arrows on the side, which will allow me to flip pages. And there I see my next lesson, lesson 32. If this is nowhere near where I mean to be, I have some, uh, some controls up here. Uh, first off, I can control the size at which I see things. Uh, it will automatically go to a size that will, uh, should be appropriate for your screen in order to see the full length of the page. But if you wanna make it bigger, you can click on the arrow, stipulate custom, and make it any size you want. It might be though that you then have to scroll to read a full page. But I'm going to click on this second icon the table of contents, which comes swooping out from the left-hand side. Um, if there's something else that I want to reference, um, really I meant to be on lesson 11, I can click there and it will refresh and take me there. And once I'm where I want to be to get my, um, my real estate back on my desktop, I can go ahead and close that. One place that you might find yourself going uh, is to the routines which uh, in every level of SIPs is Appendix A. Um, the routines is the appendix where, um, where all of the routines, both the initial routines and also the corrections are spelled out for you and uh, something that people frequently access. Um, so I click on table of contents again and then I see my, my page bigger. Um, so what you have here is a digital version of your print materials. Um, everything that is included in your teacher manual is here. Additionally, I would add that when you're within the lessons, if there is a reference to an appendix, um, it's hyperlinked. So that's a really nice piece that, um, that you have access to there. So here you see all of the all of the guidance that supports the individual routines. That is the, um, that's the digital teacher's manual. I want to pause right there and, um, and invite you to put questions in the chat or if you'd like to unmute yourself, you are, um, you're welcome to do that. Um, Laura, to your question, um, if SIPS has been purchased for you, you ought to be claiming a license which gives you five years of access from five years from the time of purchase for uh, for digital support. Um, I was suggesting that there are um, there are teachers who might benefit from perusing some of our other offerings. Um, so, for example, our being a reader uh, program, which addresses foundational skills uh, in the K two environment, uses the same scope and sequence for small group reading as SIPS, and so the learning letter names component might be a beneficial one for kindergarten and even some first grade teachers. Um, may I say, I, I don't believe that, that Skyline has a, uh, a license at this point. They, they said that they're gonna try to get one, but that's why I was wondering if there's you know, a free trial. Sure, so, so Laura, certainly, I would, I would have you establish a trial. In terms of access, it is no different, it's just that it will expire. So you'd have access to everything that you're that you're wonderful. Doing. Thank you, uh, Miss N. No, it is it is not connected to to Clever. And if you'd like to unmute and say more about your question, um, you're welcome to. Oh, I was just asking. I'm in the thing where it says add your students. Is that an option to make a student set? Yes, yes. Um, we have an advanced student with us. We'll, we'll be sure. We'll be sure to get to that. Oh, I um, I no worries. I'm going to go ahead and close out the uh, the digital teachers manual if there are no more questions there, so that I can show you the other the other resources that are included here. And remember that uh, these these same offerings are available uh, if you're teaching a different level. So, for example, Laura at high school would be using either Plus or Challenge. Um, uh, so next, I want to orient you to uh, the general resources. Uh, these are going to be really important. So there are reproducibles for student use. By the way, just, just a general thing, um, you want your arrows, I, I have my cursor on an arrow right now, you want your arrows to be facing downward so that you can see all of the resources contained within a folder or section. So under general resources, I see there's reproducibles for student use, classroom use, uh, correlations. Correlations for SIPs are all tied to K1 and 2 based on CCSS. Uh, assessments and then all of these play buttons are videos. So I just want to take you through some of the things that are here. 
reproducibles for student use. Here we have PDFs of all of the stories uh, that you would be reading at a given level. Um, when I click on that, it opens in a new tab. Um, and here I have stories uh, 1A up through 55, um, which is uh, the, last, the last lesson for the beginning level. Um, some, some educators that I'm talking to have downloaded these and then shared just a portion of them via email with their students. Um, some teachers are um, queuing this up and sharing their screen. There's lots of ways that you could make use of that resource. Um, some teachers have also um, downloaded and only shared with their students the, uh, the stories that precede where they currently are with their instruction. And when they get to their fluency time, um, they're inviting kids to go back and read those. So they're, they're finding a way to share them with families and encouraging kids to go back and reread the stories that they've previously worked on. So the stories are there. There are sight word dictionaries that are specific to different, um, different sections of the instruction. You can see it, there's queuing here for use with different lessons. There's a guided spelling page. Um, you, could, you could send that home if, if you wanted to, email it if, if folks have the, the means of printing it. Um, the family letters, uh, I would use those if, if um, if, if you're calling on families to provide support, um, if, if you think they're gonna be particularly involved, if, if somebody's experiencing SIPs newly in a remote environment that they haven't done before. And then the other reproducibles for student use, depending on when you um, acquired your SIPs materials, you may have a, uh, a yellow manual that reads uh, intensive instruction uh, for multi-sensory support. So um, we, we had the author who worked with Dr. Schaffelbein come back and provide additional supports that were intended for students with, um, with more extreme um, learning differences and those with dyslexia. And, uh, and so we have supports here, um, visual cueing, sound lines, trace and writes, all of those sorts of things. And so uh, those are available for, um, for displaying and for, um, for printing and downloading as well. And you would want to reference that yellow manual as to how to make best use of those. We also have reproducibles for classroom use, uh, the sight word index, the spelling sound wall cards, and a fluency record. Um, I really recommend you finding a way to, uh, to share your spelling sounds for your level uh, with your students. Um, you know, we, we use these in our, in our routines when we are introducing sounds, we use them for corrections. Uh, and so we want, we want to make sure that students have access to those. These are the ones for, for beginning, but some iteration of this exists for, uh, for every level. Tammy, I will be sure to get to your question about the card deck. Right. Um, the assessments are here as well. Uh, the placement assessment, though I, I can't imagine that's where there we are, where we are. Uh, but the mastery tests are here as well, and so you can you can download those. Um, I was with a group of educators two days ago, and we were talking about uh, the role of mastery tests in um, in distance learning. And I wanted to um, pause and invite you to unmute yourself uh, if you've had an opportunity yet. To, uh, to administer a mastery test since we've been um, learning from home. Is there anybody who's, who's had an opportunity to do that yet? Okay. Um, so the educator I was speaking with um, was a principal who, um, who was going to be uh, teaching SIPs for the first time. And uh, he indicated that some, some teachers didn't see how, the, how they would have an opportunity to do mastery tests. And we came up with a couple solutions that you might consider. Um, the mastery tests are always invaluable to, to you as an educator deciding whether to move forward or if you need to go back and use your B list. Um, 
I wouldn't uh, throw them out now, especially uh, considering um, it's such a different environment with regard to engagement and what have you. And so um, what we talked about is uh, we still want to be meeting with small groups. Um, SIPS is all about differentiated instruction and the small group is going to be especially important when the kids aren't assembled around your kidney table, but rather um, you know, in, in front of you, maybe in gallery view um, when you're using Zoom or some other tool. And, um, and so we want numbers such that we are able to hear kids um, we, we might even anticipate some errors and be ready with some correction routines in case we don't hear all of the, uh, the errors that, that kids are making. Um, but those mastery tests are going to be a really important litmus for whether to move forward in your instruction or to go back and do some reteaching using those B lists. And so one thing we came up with was um, if, I'm, if I'm meeting with five kids, for a, a SIP session, I might invite two or three of them to come a couple minutes in advance of the lesson and then one at a time uh, progress with them through the mastery test. The mastery test did not take very long and uh, you're going to get some really good information from that as to how to move forward. Um, something else we considered um, for, for folks who um, who would in a regular environment be doing pullout uh, is that you might join um, a regular ed session for the for the child that you're hoping to test uh, and ask that teacher to put you in a breakout room with the child and uh, administer the mastery test there. So uh, just a couple of options that that might work for you. Other resources that we have here, uh, we have a pronunciation guide. And so if you're um, if you're wanting to uh, to have a pure R for example, or if you're afraid you're going to schwa eyes one of your consonants, uh, you can go back and listen to uh, the pronunciation guide. There is also a start to finish lesson here, beginning lesson 49. I would just remind you that it is lesson 49 and that uh, there are 55 in beginning, and so a lot of scaffolding has been removed by that point in the instruction. Also, if you're looking to get real reflective about your work, I wouldn't be too self-critical right now, but there is a reflection tool that, um, that is meant for educators to think about their instruction and how to hone it. I'd also point out to you that there are resource filters down here at the bottom. And so if I'm preparing for lesson 11, I'm going to click on the arrow, drill down to lesson 11, click search, and it's going to refresh. If we were looking at my print manual and leafing through lesson 11, you would see that there are uh, QR codes, pixelated boxes in the margins of your manual. Um, in your print manual, you could scan those with the smartphone and it would take you to a video or animation um, highlighting for you a, a different, you know, the various routines. Um, those all exist here. Uh, and you don't have to wait to leaf through the pages to find it. Uh, and then you also have lesson 11A. So this is a PDF of the lesson, the, the pieces that you would be putting in front of the kids um, all ready for you if you're teaching it the first time through or lesson B if you're teaching it a second time through. And so just so you have a sense of what's included there, again, this opens in a new tab. So you can see for our blending we're going to have three sounds. Now there's nothing magical about this. I could just as easily have a handheld dry erase board with three lines and an arrow. Um, we're going to be doing two sounds. We're going to be doing two word parts. This is the, uh, the sentence that we're going to be using. And with the cat at the chair, we must be working on uh, short A. This is the word list. Now there are, there are three words here, and that might be easy enough for me to, um, to record on a dry erase board, but um, as, you, uh, as you get deeper into the program, the, um, the mixed lists get quite long, and so you might choose to print one of those, be able to hold it up for those purposes. I would also point out to you that the orientation of this um, is, differs depending on uh, what it is we're looking at, right? So it was, it was appropriate for display for, uh, for our blending but for, uh, and our sentence, but for reading, uh, reading our lists, uh, it's sideways. So you might wanna think about uh, looking at these resources, which ones you would wanna rewrite and which ones you would just want to share. Your story, for example, um, 
would have everyone cocking their head sideways. Uh, and there's your guided spelling page as well. So those are the resources that would support me in, um, in providing instruction for lesson 11 uh, first go round. Erin, what has, because I'm sharing my screen, sure. what has appeared in the chat since, since I've been talking? Something specific around uh, administering the online mastery test, would you share your screen with the child if you were to say pull them out or have, be with them one-on-one? -on -one? How would you ex administer and mastery? Uh, so I've, I've never done it and maybe you'll want to write a blog <laughs> after you do it, but let me, let me cue it up and we can think this through together. So um, I would, I would want to have it up in advance and, um, and I would want to, there's a lot here that could be distracting to a struggling reader. So I'd want to, uh, to get to the place of what we call the cards, the student right. copy. And um, just a, a tip, um, if, you're, if you're looking at a page, uh, whenever, you're, whenever you're on the internet, if you either do uh, control or command plus, depending on your device, you can increase the size of something. So I, could, I would make it such that my student was only seeing what I needed them to see. And I, in advance of the session, would want to have my piece ready to go, whether that's printed or I've, I've found another way to record my notes for that. Thank Great. you. Another question from Christine. Hi. Christine, how would, um, she wants to access the beginning reading book for kinder. Would it just be the, the pages? Is that what, at this point? Yeah, so Christine, the, the little blue books are, um, are the stories, uh, just a page at a time. And I was, I was talking about that one you mentioned in the beginning, the very beginning, you said this is a great resource for maybe kinder teachers that with beginning sound. Yellow book. Oh. Okay, so um, Christine, I was talking about our program being a reader. Yes, yes. And um, yeah, uh, let me share just a couple more things here, Christine, and then I will I will show you how to how to do that. Okay. That I, I promise I won't forget because it's it's uh, being a reader has um, has some really nice components that are supportive of of this work, uh, right. especially um, in Kinder, and yeah. and first I would say. Okay. Um, okay. Certainly. So, um, so I just shared with you, I use the resource filters to access uh, lesson 11. Um, but one that's going to be important for everybody, I mentioned this before, um, A, Appendix A is my routines at every level of SIPs. And in your teacher's manual, you can certainly um, flip to that section and read about them. But if you use the resource filters and you select Appendix A routines, you click search, when it refreshes, you have every routine from your level, both as an animation, that's what the pointer finger on the blue field is, and also as a video, that is the play button on a blue field. Um, these are the same ones that you would find had you scanned a QR code in the margins of your manual. Um, but I just really appreciate having them here. Um, I think that they're all useful, but uh, for me personally with instruction, I find that the corrections are the ones that I most want to watch. Um, it's, it's relatively seamless for me to provide the initial instruction. Where I get, where I fumble sometimes is uh, in hearing a student's error and remembering exactly what I wanna do with that information. So I just wanna show you, um, what these look like. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and share a wall correction. Sound. Humming monkey. Sound. Mm. Sound. Mm. Again. Mm. Sound. Mm. Again. Not. Read. Not. That's my colleague Anne, by the way, who is a student of Dr. Shufflebottom's. Um, and for all of the corrections, there is someone making an error, and then she is um, is providing the correction routine. Uh, so please, I I am saying being a reader. Um, please know that know that those are those are there for you. 
Okay. Um, so Christine's question uh, calls, calls up an important point. Uh, it might be that you already have an account on the Learning Hub, um, but when you claimed materials, you were only teaching beginning. And now your first graders are at a place where they're ready for extension and you don't have that. Um, or it might be Emily just mentioned being a reader and you'd like to see what that looks like. Um, so if you, once you have an account, you can add to it. What you would do is you would go up to your name in the upper right hand corner and select profile. And then you would apply the patience of Job as it seems everyone is on the internet. Um, and that third tab down, as soon as it avails itself, uh, is licenses. And so say you only had beginning, oh goodness, thank you, no. Um, say you only had beginning, but your, your first graders are to a place of extension now. Uh, you would go in and toggle, if it was purchased for you, claim a license. If, uh, if this is something that you're dabbling in, a trial program, which will give you the access through, uh, through July. And uh, Christine, to your question, being a reader is here. And uh, you could go ahead and toggle trial of kindergarten, which would allow you to see the learning letter names piece. Um, some of you probably are also implementers of Caring School Community. And so you could click on that one and uh, you would find your, um, your materials there as well. Um, Whatever you toggle when you're finished, you go ahead and click save and exit. And anything that you've added, whether, whether it be trial or actual license, will then be included in your list of materials. I have lots of materials here. Um, and so it's a carousel that I use the, um, the purple arrows to, to scroll through. So the being a reader is not, we, didn't, we don't have a license for that? No. Not at, so we, not at present anyway. It would just be a trial? Correct. But there are some PDFs there that you um, okay. secure. Emily, there was still the question about the um, card, card deck. Yes. And then there's an, a new question Mintram's asking about to see how you could actually, could you model a role play, how you would actually do the part, all parts of a SIPS lesson going live, which I know we had talked about <laughs> uh, how, how about if I do that at the end for anybody who wants to, to stay on? Does that maybe make sense, Erin? Sure. Not, I think not, not everybody needs that. Um, okay, so um, after you uh, claim or establish a trial for a level in SIPS, it toggles for you some additional resources. Uh, SIPS assessment and SIPS card deck. Um, in order to have access to the card deck, you need to have uh, at least one student uh, entered into your program. To, uh, to try it out, um, you might make a fictitious student. My, uh, my colleagues at Collaborative Classroom are teaching uh, Elvis Presley and Beverly Cleary, and I have my husband um, as one of my students, um, just so I can have access to it. And so, um, there are, I'm not going to take you through all of the minutia about this because there are tutorials, but know that um, with, with one student at a level, so here he is, Sacha Kermitas, I have two of the same guy, um, and I, I also have a student named George Irving. Um, once you have added a student and, um, and put in the level at which they're performing, you then have access to a card deck. So uh, with regard to this teachers, uh, what I will tell you is when you're looking at your carousel, whatever is on it, there's an option down here, view all in professional learning. Everybody see that? It's, uh, it's underneath the teacher's manuals. When I click on that, it opens uh, a whole set of tutorials. And many of them, all the ones that have this bright blue field behind them, are SIPS related. Uh, so there's one all about the SIPS assessment app. It provides an overview. Um, 
some teachers have, cho have chosen to use this for, uh, for grouping all of their students. So um, after they administer an assessment, paper, pencil, they, um, they will place their students into groups here. Uh, and you can um, maneuver the groups and make changes. Um, so there are tutorials on moving students, adding groups, uh, changing the names of the groups, all, all of those different things that you might do. Um, how you would do it if you were using paper pencil assessment, all of those sorts of things. Um, there are also ways uh, SDC teachers might be interested in this or, or RSP teachers in, um, in sharing students. So if I'm an RSP teacher and I want uh, the homeroom teacher to be privy to some assessment data, there might be something there that would be relevant. So I'd encourage you to check out these videos depending on, on your needs. Um, but I wanna share this one in particular with you. This is the um, SIPS card deck, presenting the cards to students. And Erin, before I do, wanted to ask of you, when, uh, when you watched Anne's video just now, were you able to hear it okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so teachers, something that I've learned, uh, and this is, this is a Zoom thing, not, not a SIPS thing. Um, when you share your screen in Zoom, um, it gives you a variety of options. Do you wanna share your whole desktop? Do you just want to share uh, the, the Chrome window that you have open? Do you wanna share a whiteboard? Down at the bottom, and it's not very prominent, there's an option to share your audio. And so for, uh, for SIPS instruction where you're talking to your kids, it, it's, uh, it's a non-issue. A non uh, but if you're looking to share audio with your kids that would be coming from your computer, toggling that um, is going to be really useful. And, um, and the way that I found it out, um, my toddler son had a dance party with some of his friends uh, virtually. And, um, and we were on Go Noodle. Uh, I highly recommend Dinosaur Stomp if you have littles at home. And in our household, we were vigorously dinosaur stomping and our friends were all kind of very quizzically looking into their cameras. And I realized about a minute in, they let us dance for quite a while before they did the reveal. They couldn't hear the audio. So um, toggling that is, is really useful. Um, let's go ahead and watch this short tutorial so everybody has a sense of the card deck. When you are using the SIPS Card Deck web app with students, you will first need to select the Card Deck icon, then select the group you plan to teach. The app will automatically create the Card Deck keyed to the lesson number of the group. Tapping on Start Lesson will bring you to the student interface, which you can use to present cards to students. The card area on the screen is a safe area that allows you to point and sweep. Around the safe area are invisible navigation buttons. The invisible buttons can be made visible by tapping on the question mark on the upper right part of the screen. Here, you will see the exit button, previous button, correct next button, and incorrect button. When you tap the incorrect button, the card will automatically be shuffled back in the deck, with the exception of the irregular cards and challenge. Tapping the previous button sends you to the previous card. Tapping the correct next button brings you to the next card. Tapping the exit button brings you back to the card deck management screen. Uh, Stephanie, I see your question. She's asking, does this card deck work for challenge level two? Um, I have not specifically explored it for that level. I, I imagine that it would. What I heard my, my colleague Maggie saying is that um, there was a component, I, I think irregulars, for, for which it was, it was not, uh, it didn't have that full functionality. But I, I believe so. Um, Again, every teacher has access to all the different levels. So if you have a student, you know, that you would want to do this with, you could access as oh, well. Perfect. Correct. Perfect. Thank you. So um, be, before you um, go and add all your students, um, un unless that is useful to you for other reasons, I would tell you that having um, a, a single student 
that is representative of a level would be enough for you to have access to this and, and to project it. So if, um, if I want a group of kids on lesson 21, I only need one child included in my group for lesson 21 in order to have that access. So you needn't flesh out the whole of your class in order to have these. Um, rather just one, one kid per, per uh, entry point. And could you show how students, is that, I know you showed there were students in one student in your class, but just is there, how do you actually add a student? Sure, so there are tutorials on, on all of those, Erin. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to maneuver around um, all of the windows uh, <laughs> to have all the real estate I need on my, on my screen here. Um, yes, yeah, so there are, there are tutorials on how to add a student um, and group them and all of those sorts of things. You'll find all of that here. And as a reminder, the way that I got to those is um, on, on the main page underneath my teacher's manuals, and this is true regardless of what I'm looking at, um, it's view all in professional learning. So that's, that's there for you there. Um, um, go ahead. See this question. Yeah. So, um, so Sonia's wondering. Deck, is go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Is, so I, I would see that if teachers don't have their cards at home, this would be a useful tool to have your card deck. Is there some other reason you would use your card deck versus the cards if you have them? So um, there, have there have been teachers in the past who've told me in, uh, in their classroom environment that um, uh, sometimes there's cachet around anything that's on a device as opposed to in your hands. And so there are teachers who have chosen to, uh, to project a card deck within their classroom uh, just because there's seemingly added draw. Um, some people feel though that it's, it's quite clumsy and that they would much rather have the cueing of, of being able to hold the card and, and really feel like their, their finger is, is driving that, that work. Um, some teachers have also confessed that projecting it onto the wall in their classroom, um, if they're pulling a group aside and they have uh, learners working on other things is quite distracting. So um, I, I think it really depends on, on your experience. Um, you, you see with all of the materials that I've shared with you that you have access to pretty much everything but your handheld cards with what's available here. Um, and and through, the, through the card deck, you have those. Uh, but some folks have just invested in some index cards and have elected to do that just because of uh, the comfort and ease. Um, the other thing is depending on what your learners are like, you might prefer to um, to not be sharing your screen, um, but rather have the gallery view or the Brady Bunch view, whereby you can see everybody who's a part of your session and you can see all of them and their mouths moving as you do that swipe. Uh, so you'll need to think about your learners and, and what works best for them. Um, the other thing that I wanna say, and, and this, is, this is not SIPs, this is just um, distance learning and maybe education in general. I've come across a, a quote recently from Voltaire that, uh, that perfect is the enemy of the good. And so I would just encourage you to, uh, to give yourself some grace with all of this. Uh, try some things out. If there's a major hiccup, then you can do uh, the same lesson with list B the following day. Um, and so I just wanted to, to share that with you. This is, this is new for all of us. Emily? Yes. Um, I, I'm not, I don't know the answer to this. Do you, does everyone in OUSD have access to the SIPS um, online learning hub? I know I've used it with a couple different settings, but do you know how many, is it a matter of licenses that we? It, it is a matter of licenses. So folks should only be claiming the levels that were, that were purchased for them. Okay, so Nicole, I'll have to, we'll have to research about secondary and seeing about licenses. <laughs> um, and 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 just a reminder, um, at the at the secondary level, it would either be a plus or challenge that you would be using. Yeah, we're using it with our newcomer groups as well. So um, yeah, so we'll. Okay. Um, so that's, that's the Learning Hub. I'd really encourage you to, um, to go back to those tutorials um, if need be. Um, a couple other things that I wanted to, to share with you. Um, 
so here's another website. This is um, collaborativeclassroom.org. This is the, uh, the main uh, website for Collaborative Classroom, publishers of SIPs and Caring School and what have you. Um, we have, um, we've created some remote learning resources that I think are very valuable and, and some of them would support instruction quite apart from, from our, um, our programs. And so if, if you visit collaborativeclassroom.org and you, uh, you do a search for remote learning, uh, it's going to take you, oh, let me model that. So the search is just up at the top of the screen and uh, you'll see that we've provided uh, guidance for, um, for remote learning. And so um, there, are, there are blogs on coaching during remote learning. Um, one of my colleagues who, uh, who's worked extensively in our after school curricula has written about um, engaging with math during remote learning. But this top one, Collaborative Classroom Guidance for Remote Learning, has uh, supports and ideas for all of our programs. Information about uh, copyrights sharing, best practices, tips for parents and families. So there's a lot here that you might want to take a look at. Um, if you're teaching Caring School, there's a section on that. There's uh, Learning Letter Names, Christine, if you wanted to take a look at that, that portion. And then when you click on SIPs, it scrolls down to SIPs for you. And, uh, and there are two things here that I really wanted to point out to you. Uh, best practices for teaching SIPs remotely. So Collaborative Classroom hosts a lot of webinars and, um, and my colleagues do a lot of modeling of SIPs uh, in a virtual environment. And there's quite a bit that they've learned from that. And so I would encourage you to take a look at this blog. Um, we're talking about things like what I, what I suggested, using the gallery view so you're able to see all your kids at once. Um, so lots of, lots of tips here on, um, on how you might do these things. So they're talking about setting up one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions with your kids so that you could hear them um, reading from their, um, from their fluency books or, um, or, or setting up one-on-one -on -one sessions for the mastery tests. Uh, if that works for you, fine. If not, some of the things I talked about earlier in our session might work. And then the other, the other offering that's here under SIPs that I would point out to you is uh, early on, one of our users, um, early on in coronavirus, I should say, um, started using SIPs with one of her SPED students and, um, and she chronicled her experience here uh, talking about best practices that she had gleaned. And what I really appreciate is she even um, took some pictures of her setup. So, uh, uh, there she had, she actually had access to her handheld cards. That, that was nice. Uh, but she had two devices going. She had her um, digital manual on one and uh, another one in which she was uh, engaging with her kids. Um, so you might want to think about, about that, what your, uh, what your instructional space is going to look like. So I think that, I think that that will be really useful to you. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to share, and I mentioned this at the beginning, is that um, Collaborative Classroom has a Facebook group called the Collaborative Classroom Community. And these aren't, oh, pardon me, <laughs> that's Henry. Um, uh, the, not just SIPS users, so uh, folks who are using all of our programs and, and folks who are, I guess, prospective users uh, have joined this group as well. But there are lots of questions that are being posed here. Teachers taking pictures of their, um, their remote learning environments, uh, sharing questions and solutions. We've also been hosting several Facebook Lives on a variety of topics. And so you might find those useful. Uh, we just hosted one yesterday, 30 minutes on uh, teacher wellness practices. I found that for me to be uh, time well spent. Uh, but we've had sessions on coaching uh, during a time of remote learning, um, where coaches were talking about being invited to um, to sessions that their teachers were leading with students, maybe even being a part of breakout rooms. There have been some really great ideas that have been shared here. Um, and so 
I think there's just there, there's a lot that's that's really rich here. The role of uh, of interventionist. So all of there are there are the videos of the previous Facebook sessions that uh, that might be useful to you. Um, uh, this teacher was on one of our calls. Uh, she's um, she's been doing being a reader with her kids and um, something that I'd encourage you to think about. Um, they have been teachers in her district have been recording themselves um, leading the small group instruction um, just on their own. Um, so we've been talking a lot about various aspects of uh, accessibility. You know, so there's a question of whether or not kids have access to devices, um, what kind of internet they have. Um, sometimes they have access to devices, but not at the time that you would, you would typically want to schedule your, your group session. And so something to think about is uh, in her district, they recorded these sessions with just the teacher uh, with the idea that it could be done asynchronously. And so this is a teacher modeling, um, it's being a reader, but it will feel very similar. Uh, the SIPs um, beginning teachers, you'll, you'll see a lot in there that you know. Um, and she pauses and in the pause, kids who are joining asynchronously at different times would be responding. Molly, can I add on something? Um, I just wanted to put a plug for um, our Google Classrooms that we've set up, the centrally housed. And if you go on the Kinder, if you're part of the Kinder Google Classroom, there's a teacher that has shared her YouTube channel with all of her SIP mm -hmm. lessons that she's done as, as another um, example of how you could do SIPs remotely too. So I just wanted to encourage teachers, if you're not part of those Google Classrooms, there's a lot of great resources on there as well. Terrific. Um, Aaron, what else is coming up in the chat? Uh, there's just a, a lot of questions that are about the access. Um, and so I'll need to figure that out. I mean, I know that if you, if you are, have, have been using SIPs and you want to get on it, you can go on and, and claim a, a license. So, you know, feel free to claim a license for the um, kit that you are, are working with. And if you're unable to, I would say, let me know and we'll figure it out. <laughs> um, the only other thing that, that I've been really thinking about teachers um, that, that you'd wanna consider is um, like other instruction that you're providing, this is so new for our kids. And so um, I'd really encourage you to think about all, all the factors um, that are different now that the children are at home. So um, stopping to talk about what the norms for instruction are with SIPs, um, all, of, all of those sorts of things. Uh, I'd also be really mindful of, of some sensitivities. You know, I, I saw um, a meme on Facebook recently that uh, a group of first graders all wanted to show each other um, their homes. And so they were running around with the devices, look, this is my bedroom and this is where my sister sleeps. And, and so there are distractions on, on that end because you're not all in the same space. Um, but we also have kids who are very self-conscious about the environments from which they're joining. And so I, there's just, there's a, there's a lot to think about um, quite apart from SIPs that, that can influence instruction. And so I'd, I'd encourage you to think about those things. Also, um, I'm hearing a, um, a variety of experiences in terms of um, whether or not parents are around and, um, and whether they're engaging and, and thinking about that as well. Uh, so there might be some norms that you need to set around, around that sort of thing. Um, some teachers have told me there's a parent in the background prompting, you know, you need to be louder or, um, and, and we want this to be a space where, where kids feel safe. Um, teachers have also talked about whether or not they, um, they want to record a session in which kids are engaged for the students who have to join asynchronously. So that's something to think about with regard to uh, confidentiality and who would have access and, and all of that sort of thing. So there's, um, there's just a lot that's, that's going on for all of us and I wanna honor that and, um, and thank you for your efforts. And I, I hope that this has been helpful. Um, and I wanna pause right here and, um, and see what else is coming up for you and see if I can be a, a guide at all. Hmm. 
Okay. So um, Min Tram is, is calling on us to have a, a second session in which we talk about best practices that we've arrived at. Yeah, and then we had talked about, you know, doing a demo or a, of a lesson to show how you would do a full lesson. Is Should we set that up? You had mentioned staying on or should we try to set that up maybe a different time to... Um, what, what makes more sense, Erin? I think maybe we should try to set up a, another one and, and record it and so people can get, yeah, a different time. I think so too, so we can invite everyone back with the real purpose of seeing a SIPS lesson in, in yeah. learning mode. <laughs> yeah. So I'll follow up with Kellef and see how we can uh, put on the calendar or send something out so that we can get people to see a SIPS lesson. That, that sounds great. I'd be happy to do that.